Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for session one of our Array October event. We are devoting the month of October to all things Array. We'll be focusing on multi-hydrophone deployments known as Arrays. Throughout this month, we'll be sharing content about Arrays, how to build them, when and why to use them, as well as inviting different experts to join us for live sessions exploring acoustic arrays from around the world. We are starting local with our exploration of arrays, and I'm joined today by Mark Wood, President and CEO of Ocean Sonics, and Pierre Almeida, Ocean Sonics Business Development Lead. Hi, Mark and Pierre. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, Rose. Good morning, or good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be morning where, where some people are watching. Absolutely. <laughs> So for those of you tuning in who may be unfamiliar with Ocean Sonics, we are an ocean acoustics company based in Truro, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. We created the IC Listen, and this is a real-time smart hydrophone. It's a tool that's used to collect ocean sound data, and what makes it special is that this hydrophone processes data at the source in real time, so you can actively listen and view data while the sensor is deployed. Our goal through the creation of the IC Listen was to make ocean sound data more accessible. Accessibility happens through a number of ways, including the ease of use. Hydrophone arrays are notoriously difficult to design, assemble, and deploy. They also produce huge amounts of data, require smart power budgeting and configuration. By using IC Listen for an acoustic array, many of these headaches are alleviated. These hydrophones self-synchronize and are relatively low power. So, and they also come with deployment tools, such as control hubs and specialized software to make array assembly, deployment, and data collection easier. So to kick off Array October, we wanted to start with an introduction to acoustic arrays. So first, Mark will introduce hydrophone arrays and their applications, and then Pierre will follow with an in-depth look at how to assemble various arrays and which array is best suited for various projects. After Mark and Pierre finish their presentation, we are going to have a uh, question and answer period. And if you wanna know some more detail about what we covered today, you can leave us a comment on our live feeds and we're gonna do our best to answer it after the presentation live. So now I'll let uh, Mark begin the presentation. I'm going to share your screen and we'll get right into it. Thanks Rose. Okay, so we're going to talk about hydrophone arrays. And if we can go to the next slide. There we go. So why, why do we have hydrophone arrays? Why do we, we even think about using them? Well, think about humans or that, that humpback whale that, that's on the right hand side of that slide. They have two ears and those two ears allow them to hear better. It allows them to locate sounds, which might be really important if your life depends on it. Uh, you get better coverage. So your, your head actually blocks some of the sounds coming from the opposite side of, of, of your head from your ear. So by having a second ear, you get the, the full coverage. But also uh, having two ears allows us to know something about the space around us. So if you close your eyes and walk into a gymnasium, you're going to know you're in a gymnasium. You don't need to your, your, your sight or vision to see that. If you're in a small room with carpets in, and uh, curtains, it's going to be really quiet. It's going to be muffled in there. And so we have learned uh, through our, our processing to use our two ears to process those sounds and know what kind of space we're in. We know about uh, the, the medium that we're listening in. So two ears, we can do all of these things. So imagine if you had four or more listening points. And that's what we're going to talk about with hydrophone arrays. Next. So first, we're going to start with a single hydrophone. So a typical hydrophone is omnidirectional. Uh, it, it listens in all directions. The body itself sometimes blocks a little bit. But for all intents and purposes, it hears equally in all directions. And so what it does is it gets soundscape data. It collects or it captures all the sounds that are in the vicinity of the hydrophone that are loud enough to be recorded by it. So that means it's sensitive to local conditions. If it's noisy there, if it's reverberated, if it's shallow, all those things will affect it. The other thing is that you have one hydrophone. So if it fails, now you have no acoustic data. So this, this is uh, one of the challenges we have with a single channel. So who uses single hydrophones? Well, if you're in the construction business and you need to uh, have environmental compliance, then you're going to want a hydrophone in there to show that you're not making too much sound while you're working in the water. Uh, soundscapes, so if you're a researcher or maybe working with an institute that is 
and wants to know more about the uh, environment, then you can gather soundscapes. If you need to know whether or not there are sea mammals present for operations or for uh, work at sea, then you need to do marine mammal monitoring. And of course, ocean observation. There are a number of observatories around the world and they need hydrophones to study uh, the, those, the sound in those observatories. Next. So if you have two or more hydrophones, you could do lots of, of really useful things. So one of them is you can reduce nearby noise. If you combine those hydrophones together, you can reduce the, the, the local noise and, and hopefully improve the uh, signal to noise uh, performance of it. You can reduce nearby effects. So if you have say uh, a reflective surface or something like that, then by having more hydrophones, you can account for those, those nearby effects more easily. You can also determine the direction of a sound. So we're gonna talk more about that in, in the next slide. And you can also listen in a particular direction. So imagine you have a flashlight, it's nighttime. You point that flashlight where you want to look and it illuminates that area and now you can see it. So we can do something similar if we have the right kind of hydrophone array. We can also learn more about the listening environment, just like we know what kind of room we're standing in. Using the right kind of processing, we can know a lot more about our listening environment by using hydrophone arrays. So uh, who's using uh, the hydrophones? Well, people involved in tracking and localization of sound sources that can be an animal or a pinger or whatever. Uh, vessel speed, if you can localize a vessel multiple times, you've got its track, and then from its track, you can figure out its speed. And also uh, earthquakes and tsunami, you can, with a hydrophone array, detect and localize a hydrophone or a tsunami type event. And those ocean observatories, sometimes they want to know more than just the soundscape. They want to know something about the space that those hydrophones are being used in. And so it's a great way to uh, gather that kind of information as well in these observatories. Next. So uh, just to dive a little deeper into direction of sound, uh, on the right, you'll see a straight line. That's eight hydrophones array, array uh, hydrophone array arranged in a straight line. The sound's arriving at an angle from the top right, and you notice that it arrives at each of those hydrophones at a slightly different time. So what we can do is calculate the time difference that, that, that arrives at each of those hydrophones, and using the, uh, the distance between the hydrophones, we can calculate the angle. And knowing the angle, we know the bearing of that sound. Now, there's one problem with a straight line array. It's a very simple geometry. It's probably one of the simplest ones is that you have a risk of ambiguity. So those sounds could be coming up from the lower right as well. And uh, um, there's, there's no simple way of, of, of differentiating between the two. So a lot of effort can go into designing uh, a good hydrophone array that eliminates the ambiguity, the kind that, that, that uh, can um, cause some problems. So good hydrophone array design uh, is important to, to deal with ambiguity. Next slide. So hydrophone array users typically fall into these groups. So you've got researchers, people who are studying uh, the ocean, studying marine life, or, or studying uh, the effects in the ocean. Um, ocean warming is actually another thing you can measure with sound. Um, but with hydrophone arrays, what you can do is, is you can actually count sea mammals. So if, if you know where various whale calls came from in the area around your hydrophone array, then you can know how many whales are there or what they call density. So you can measure the number of whales per volume of ocean space. And this is an important measurement for researchers. In the case of security, you might have a, um, a place where you want to uh, protect it. So that means you, you need to know whether you have uninvited visitors that are coming and where they're going and that kind of thing. So arrays are good for that. Compliance professionals, uh, there are some cases where uh, you're, you're measuring sound for compliance to make sure that that is the right kind of sound. And uh, in this case, you need to account for the listening environment. So if, if there is an effect caused by the medium, the being near the surface, for example, or near the bottom, then the array will help you account for that. And ship design. So ship designers are using hydrophone arrays now to know where sounds come from in ships. And so by knowing if it comes from one side or one end or whatever, then they can use that information to quieten those areas. They can optimize the design. And because ships are one of the most prominent sources of, of sound and sound pollution in the sea, there's a lot of effort now going into making uh, new ships quieter. Next. So digital arrays are, um, 
unique in, in the sense that they're not like analog arrays. So the sensor is digital. That means that uh, uh, at the sensor, the output is a digital signal, not an analog one. So because they're outputting digital signals from each of the sensors, they need to be synchronized. And so what Oceansonics has done is we spent a lot of effort and time trying to get that synchronization right. So we actually synchronize right down to the analog to digital converter. That means you get exactly the same number of, of samples from each hydrophone and you get them at exactly the same time. And so that means you, you truly have synchronized data. It also means you don't need to worry about things like sample slip. That's where you have an extra sample in one channel that the other ones don't have or, or vice versa. And uh, it's, it turns out to be kind of messy to sort those things out. So we just go straight to the source and, and eliminate that problem altogether. The other thing is that data streams must match. If you have four digital data streams, they need to be compatible, they need to be synchronized, and they need to be combined in a way, in a standard file format that can be used by the software or by the user or by the file processing system. The other thing is that if the data is in a digital form, then it can be sent over long cables, it can be sent through the internet, it can be sent through the cell phone system where you get kind of you know random delays and things like that. You have all sorts of options for getting that data from your hydrophone array to the user. Next slide. So what are the key parts of a hydrophone array? Uh, well, the most important thing is, is on the left you have the host. So the host is a workstation or a computer and a person. And so that the person needs to look at the information that they have acquired from the acoustic data. So it might be the raw data, it might be a spectrogram, or it might be something that's highly processed, like a marine mammal density or whatever. But the host is the destination for the data. And usually there's, there's a decision or an interpretation that takes place there. On the other end, you have your digital sensors on the right hand side. So you have those sensors that are collecting that data, perhaps pre-processing it, and then sending it down the line along the digital data link. And so that, that data link can, can be one of a number of different forms, but then it is gathered and, and collated at the host connection. So the host connection takes that data and puts it into a form that can be used by your host. So that can be ethernet, it can go through the internet, it can connect to a radio, or it can plug straight into it. So there's lots of ways to build it up uh, using these key parts. And so now it's Pierre's turn to tell you a little bit about how we uh, deploy hydrophone arrays. Thank you, Mark. So I'm gonna start off with uh, the most popular and the most well used around the globe and is a static deployment for real-time listening. So to start off is that you have an IC listen or, or an array of them, and then you have a cable that goes from those hydrophones to shore up to 400 meters using ethernet or if you're looking to go over that, uh, you can go with a fiber link. Um, on the shore end, you would have the controller hub, and then you have the web interface and the IC listen that would show you um, each stream of the hydrophone or the combined data stream. And so what are these used for? So the most common one is the tracking and localization. We actually, a few years ago, we did something called the whale tracking network in British Columbia. This, it was used and still used today to track the resonant killer whales in real time, all done through sound. So these were all done with static arrays. Another thing is that in a busy area where uh, vessel speed is very important, you can get the vessel speed of a vessel um, from a static array or even earthquake and tsunami monitoring or ambient noise monitoring. These can all be done with subsea static arrays. And then the question is, how do you deploy or how does it look? So the way it looks is, um, this is the first way. So it's called an IC link in the middle, which it has four extension cables to the channels, so each hydrophone, and then one coming back to shore. So this right here allows you to do very, very, very different variations sub C. So for example, let's say you wanna make two of those channels close together at one meter and the other two at say 70 meters, you can do that with this deployment. Um, and the good thing about this is that it allows you to turn each hydrophone on and off depending on what you're looking for. So if you're trying to conserve power for a little bit, you can duty cycle just one hydrophone or two or multiple. So it has a lot of power inside that IC link or the, the hub. So this is what the hub looks like when it's connected to a tripod um, and into the shore station. So right now you have the four hydrophones with a, about a one meter separation. 
So then you can actually track and locate and um, the sound source. And then you have the cable that's going to the shore to the host controller. And that host controller is connected to two items, a GPS, which gives you your uh, synchronized universal time to the, all the hydrophones, and into either uh, an ethernet jack, so you can connect into your network, or if it's in a remote location, you can do radio. So going back to your main station so you can get it from your office. Um, so the great thing about this is you can have multiple of these stations kilometers apart, all going to one uh, main station so you can get all your data from your office. And the other way is with a smart cable. So the smart cable is, um, it's a minimalist design. And so what that means is that it has one cable for all four hydrophones. It acts like an ethernet switch. So it gives each hydrophone um, data, power and sync. So it makes an array with a very small um, footprint. So these are good for where areas are tight or these are known array, um, uh, known array separation, then the smart cable would be ideal for that. And one of those incident instances is a drifting buoy. So the reason the smart cable is ideal for this is because it takes up next to no room so it can drift in the water very easily with little to no noise. So in order to have a drifting buoy, uh, the yellow buoy on top is made by Ocean Sonics, also known as the Ocean Sonics Wi-Fi buoy. So this buoy is a smart buoy. So built inside of it, it has batteries, GPS time sync, and Wi-Fi. So you can actually connect to one or all the hydrophones from about 100 feet away from a kayak or, or on shore without actually get, touching or getting close to uh, the area you're trying to measure. So this allows you to record much higher quality sounds from a distance. And what are these used for? So this is a, an example of one of the buoys that you are used in the Gulf of St. Lawrence to do research. And there's also uh, the Bay of Fundy. Due to its high flow environment, the drifting buoy with a heave plate is ideal because it goes with the water, allowing you to record a lot of extra sounds that you wouldn't be able to with, for example, a moored buoy. And so uh, through the Wi-Fi, you can connect via uh, the internet, which is a web interface, or with Lucy. And then you can actually download the data, configure the data, or uh, change the settings of the hydrophone all wirelessly. So you don't actually have to get close to it, which is really cool. So here's the coolest thing about this, this deployment. You can actually scale it. So because these buoys are smart and they all have GPS time, they can actually form a very large array without even being, without talking to each other because they're all using our GPS time sync. So now you just scaled a one buoy three channel array to a 12 channel hydrophone array. And these could be, let's say, a couple feet apart or they could be kilometers apart. And because of the GPS, it syncs all of them together. So this right here would give you better quality of the soundscape that you're trying to record it. But let's say you want to do only a few buoys and then you want to have a static array too. You can do that. So with the GPS, it allows you to do that. So you can actually mix and match everything together like big Lego blocks. And these will all be synchronized within a millisecond of each other, no matter how close or how far away they are. But let's say you have your own network and you have your own PPS, which is pulse per second, or PTP, precision time protocol. You can do that too. You don't have to use our GPS time sync. You could use whatever syncing capabilities you have available to you. So the hydrophones will adapt. It could be um, with the same hydrophone. You can actually use any type of GPS you want or synchronization equipment you have. So this will make it ideal if you're looking to track or localize uh, sound sources or you're trying to build a, uh, a network of array over kilometer distance. So um, last but not least, it's a vertical array. These are very popular. So with the vertical array, you have the, the, the digital hydrophone, you have a smart cable, a control hub, then you have either um, a submersible float or a surface float that would keep the vertical array uh, vertical. And then you'd have the web interface in Lucy coming from the control hub. So if you look in the picture, you see these black uh, horizontal things. Those are called ladder array clamps. And those right there allow you to move the hydrophone, move the hydrophone separation closer, further apart from the other hydrophones. So let's say for one project, you're looking for very close um, separation. You can do that. 
And then let's say tomorrow you want to make it further. You can do it also with the exact same equipment. You don't need to buy anything special or adapt um, or duct tape something together. The hydrophones and the equipment can, is all versatile to be able to do that. So you don't need to buy new equipment every single time you have a new project. You just have to adapt the equipment that you already have. And a great thing about this vertical array is that it has two tension, mem uh, two tension membranes, one on each side. So this allows you to control which direction your vertical array is actually pointing. Although all the sensors are omnidirectional, it's always good to get your uh, bearings uh, from the surface or from a known bearing so it'd be easy to calculate where your sound sources are coming from. And so what are these used for? What, what is this? Why does somebody want a vertical array? So number one reason would be beam steering or water column data collection. So to see where a sound source is coming from in the water. So if you're looking for um, high frequency sounds, your sensors tend to be a little bit closer together compared to low frequency sounds when they tend to be further apart. Another great example of um, a vertical array, uh, vertical array application is um, some of the uh, ISO standards for ship signatures. So when new ships are built, they have to check the signatures of these vessels to see if they're quiet enough um, for today's standards. And so you can do that with a vertical array. And so what if you wanna make a large vertical array or a large horizontal array? We can do that. So we can do up to 32 channels or digital hydrophones with one single short cable. This allows you to have, um, each smart cable allows you to have four hydrophones and to connect two or more hydrophone or smart cables together, you use something called a bus adapter. And this bus adapter controls the power and the data for the array. And so by combining uh, the maximum would be eight smart cables with eight bus adapters. Now you have a 32 channel array and this array could be anywhere from um, one meter apart to 50 meters apart um, the channel. So it really is customizable for everything you need. And again, you can use the same equipment to adapt for the, the next project. And again, because the hydrophones are digital instruments, these are calibrated digital instruments, you don't need anything else on the shore end. You don't need a supercomputer. You don't need anything uh, with power um, because all the processing, everything is done within the hydrophone and within the equipment. So the control hub itself is what's combining all these data streams together, and controlling all the streams. So what does this look like? So it looks like this. So this is actually a screenshot from a web browser. So again, the computer that you're hosting or the host is not doing any of the, the hardcore processing. Everything's being done inside the hydrophone. So the hydrophone actually gives out your raw waveform data and it gives you processed FFT data all in real time. So if you're looking at a four channel hydrophone, you're look, or four channel array, you're looking at full bandwidth for all four of those um, up to, so you get to listen to 10 Hertz all the way up to 200 kilohertz for those four channels. And so the web interface looks like this. And so you have uh, all your channels coming in, you have your FFT and your waveform data, and you can change uh, the order of the streams. You can change the size of the stream. So for example, as you see in the middle one, it is larger. Um, so everything is customizable for that project and it's all done through the web browser. The great thing about this is because it's done on a web browser, you can use your cell phone, your iPad, your tablet, whatever you have to display the data. And even multiple people can be accessing it all at the same time. So if you're working with a team, it's very easy because you can all be doing the same research or the same visual uh, data processing all at the same time on different computers. So this makes it really ideal for the beam steering or to see where the sound source is coming from especially if you put the, all the hydrophones in order as the vertical array. So I talked a lot about real-time deployments and Ocean Science is a real-time <laughs> company, but what about logging deployments or logging arrays? The IC Listen itself actually has a built-in uh, battery and memory. So the, ba the hydrophone itself has eight hour battery life and 256 gigabytes of internal data. So what that means is that if we connect it to an external battery pack, now you can go for an X number of days. So if you plug four hydrophones into one battery pack, they'll actually all self-synchronize to form an array. So what that means is one will become a sync out and the rest will become sync ins, and then they will all become one, will be all listening as one, and then all the data can be processed together as one. And so these are ideal for places that are um, 
in rough conditions that are known for unfortunately there's theft. Um, so you can put an acoustic release on this. So it would be visually you can't see it or it's a known fishing area. So these are all areas where you, where a logging battery pack would be ideal. And so for example, if you use our battery packs, you're looking about um, for one hydrophone, you're looking about 90 day deployment. If you're looking at, you can do use any battery you want. So as long as it's a subsea battery and 24 volts or 12 volts, you can use it with our equipment. So you don't need to use an Ocean Songs battery for that, but that's one of the options you can do. So um, it is very customizable and you can also change um, some of the memory in the inside too, to make it up even larger, depending on your project, or we can make it duty cycle. So to extend that up to a year. And then that right there is um, my part there. Thank you so much. Thanks for that markup here. And wow, what a great way to start off Array October. Uh, let's get rid of some questions. I know that I have a few questions for you. And if any of you watching have a question for Mark or Pierre, want to know a little bit more about Arrays, leave it in our social media feeds. We are monitoring them right now, so we will do our best to answer your questions live. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a question, and I, I'm going to pose this to both of you. Um, but what is the most common use for an array? You mentioned a lot of different applications, but typically when someone's asking for an array, what would they like to do? Do you want me to answer that, Mark? Or? Oh, go ahead, Pierre, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so one of the most common things is just a quality of sound, and also another big thing is redundancy. So when you have more than one hydrophone, you feel a lot better going and doing these uh, deployments, especially long-term or, or high, high value um, uh, research vessels. So by having multiple hydrophones recording multiple um, de uh, depths or distances, you have a higher quality of sound. And then now you can have, <clears throat> um, you can actually use that to your advantage. So when you go back to do research, you can notice that let's say the sound is different down at the 1000 meter mark compared to it is uh, shallow with all the waves, right? So the sound does travel differently in water depths and that right there can be found with like a vertical array. Or another one is uh, if you do a horizontal array, <clears throat> sorry, you do a horizontal through the sea bottom, then you get to see that, let's say you're, the marine mammals you're, you're observing all travel in this canal on the right hand side, right? You'll never be able to figure that out with just using one single hydrophone. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Pierre. No problem. Yeah, and just, just to add to that, uh, we, we find that a lot of people are using small kind of like tripod type arrays for, for tracking animals, uh, dolphins and, and uh, corpses. And uh, uh, we actually have one user that has uh, two buoys with a vertical arrays and they're using it to, to track um, a belugas in the open water. So it's, it's pretty cool how you, you can um, locate and track these animals with a hydrophone array. That actually um, rolls really well into our next question. We have a question here from Terry, who would like to know, is there post-processing software to use the array data for localization? That is uh, not an easy question to answer. There, there is lots of software available that, that does processing of data. Uh, PamGuard is probably the most popular one. And we have some in-house software as well. We have the Lucy software, which uh, will be doing some of that in the future, and you have other uh, programs that are in the public domain, like Raven. Um, but in terms of a general purpose software package that, that does all of those things, that, that's still kind of on, on everybody's Christmas wish list. But uh, I, I think we're getting closer with the capability of, of doing that. Uh, the challenge is uh, knowing in advance what animals that you can find there and making sure you're not looking for the wrong ones. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that question, Terry. I hope um, we... We did our best. Um, maybe we can go a little bit more in depth with you uh, at a later date. Um, so something that I'd like to know, arrays produce a lot of data. How can a person manage so much information? Uh, well, we spent a lot of time talking about data budgeting. So data budgeting is, is recognizing that, that uh, hydrophones in general and hydrophone arrays in particular produce a lot of data. So one of the things that you can do is, is think about what the outcome of your project is. So if you don't actually need terabytes of raw data, then maybe what you can do is, is as you're gathering the data, find ways to reduce it. 
So an example of that is, is to record the wave data at lower frequency because that might be important to you, but record the spectral, the process spectral data at a high frequency. And so just that one thing can reduce the quantity of data you're collecting by one or two orders of magnitude. Uh, we've actually done case studies where you can reduce the, the data, the quantity of data um, recorded with no information loss by a factor of 200. So that's that's massive, that's significant. And, and so uh, there's other techniques, uh, more classical ones like duty cycling and that kind of thing. But one of the things that we're actively working on is finding ways to download the, the processing uh, of the, the standard techniques. So the FFT is the most um, obvious one. Uh, we have a, a mode called Epoch mode where we're looking for uh, user configured acoustic events. So you can set it to listen for say a pinger or for uh, a certain sea mammal sound, and then you can have it send you a message and selectively record the data when those types of events happen. And so we're looking at some more advanced techniques for selectively recording the data or extracting information and, and, and storing that as well. That actually um, works really well with my next question for you. And Mark, um, is there a special data format for storing data from your hydrophone array? Um, well, we use uh, the wave file format. Uh, there, there's lots of ways to store wave data, but we've decided to stick with with uh, kind of the standard format. So the way we populate the headers is we believe that the right way to do it. The proof of that is is uh, I think all of the software programs that we know of can take uh, our wave data and, and process it in a meaningful way. Um, the nice thing about wave files is that they they don't put a hard limit on the number of channels you can record. So if you have a 32 channel hydrophone array, you can store that in a wave file format. And WAV files, people complain about them, but one of the things that that they that I like about them is is that they're really compact. There's not a lot of wasted space in in a WAV file. You've got your header, and then basically you just have your your binary data stored in a nice, efficient form. So I, I've heard a mention of Lucy, and that is a software um, offered by Ocean Sonics. But is there um, a specialized software specifically for arrays, specifically for viewing multiple channels? Um, but, um, there, there are lots of, of uh, software tools out there that allow you to look at array data. The new version of Lucy called Lucy2 uh, will also allow you to look at array data. So, so Lucy2 is designed for hydrophone arrays. So when we launched our next generation of, of hydrophones, then we wanted to have some software that would go with it. So uh, you can do that with, with uh, the Lucy2 software. Um, I don't know if there are any other easily accessible uh, hydrophone array processing systems because people tend to want to do very specific things when they're using hydrophone arrays. And this is, I think, a question perhaps for you, Pierre. Um, Jackie has asked us, are, is our export licenses required for deep water array deployments? They are. So anything over at 1,000 meters, we do need an end user statement for mainly because of the hydrophone and anything over 1,000 meters. So the question is yes, but it is not very um, difficult and the export permit officers are really nice. And as long as they, you guys want to work with us, that it's not um, not a big issue at all. So and we always look at it as very negative. They're not. They're just looking, they're looking to help and they're always very helpful there too. So, Right. And if, if Jackie is in Canada or the U.S., then there are no export permits required. It's only outside of this, this territory that we need to, to get Correct. the permits. So, Mark, you said something that I found really interesting uh, during your portion of the presentation. You mentioned security. And always when we think of security, we think of, um, you know, perhaps a military activity. But could using a hydrophone array help secure something like a marine protected area and prevent, say, illegal fishing? Sure. Yeah. Uh, there's 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 growing interest in, in using um, what you might call uh, invisible methods for detecting people who shouldn't be in marine protected areas. There's more and more marine protected areas every year. There's some off the coast of Canada and, and there's there's some in, in, in almost any uh, fishing area in the world. And so we want to keep uh, people uh, out of those protected areas to protect the wildlife that's in them. So you, you can use a, a hydrophone uh, array to do that kind of thing. The, the, I guess the only real challenge is, is getting the data back. So we need some way to get to the surface. And so there are some, some um, technologies that are being developed now that allow us to have something that's totally on the bottom, except when we want to send a message saying, hey, uh, 
you need to come over here and check this out. Looks like there's, there's something going on that shouldn't be here. And that same technique can also be used to protect harbors. So there, in, in some cases, you, you want to manage the traffic in and out of a harbor. So you can use uh, those methods in, in, in those locations as well. And that rolls perfectly into this next question. It's like you're reading my mind. Um, how do you use arrays if they're spaced over a very large area, like the marine protected area? You want to do that one, Peter? Uh, yeah, I can. <clears throat> so the the question was, how do you use an array like that? Is that what you what you said? Yeah. So if it's if it's a very spaced out, that's a very large area that's being monitored. How do you how do you use this array? Absolutely. So by by the array being a far apart from each other, this allows us even easier to be able to see where the sound source is coming from. So let's say there's a vessel coming in northbound uh, and then it changes direction eastbound. So depending on the array, you can actually see all this. And depending on the triggers that you have set up to notify you, it can be used really well for policing those marine protected areas. So before you're on your way there, you can actually see in which direction that vessel is going. Right. So one of the big things, if you just have one hydrophone or a very small array in one in one uh, little area, you can only get sound or high quality sound when the vessel is near that. Right. Let's say you're the vessel is 100 kilometers away from that one array that you have there. Then you can't really tell. Well, you can, but it would be a little, uh, much more difficult than it would be if you have, let's say, 10 or 15 different hydrophones over kilometers apart. Then you get to see in real time where that vessel is, where it's going and uh, hopefully to catch it in its tracks. And that goes for, and this all can be done through satellite, Iridium, um, GSM, or if you're close enough, Wi-Fi or WiMAX. So Pierre, I have another question for you. In your slide, when you were discussing the whale tracking network in British Columbia, um, you showed an HCI, so a host control interface, mm -hmm. and also showed an IC link. Yes. What's the difference between these two? Do you need both to make uh, an IC listen array work? So you don't need both. So you could use a smart cable with the host controller, or you can use an extension cable with the host controller, or you can use an IC link with the host controller. So the host controller is just, um, it's the host on the shore end, which allows you to manage power, connect radio, connect the ethernet. It just allows you to use everything much more easily so you don't have to make your own mucks per se. Now. The thing about an IC link is the IC link also controls the power going to all the hydrophones. So you can actually turn off one or two or the whole the whole array all done through the IC link compared to even a, um, a smart cable where it will always connect all the power and data to all the channels. So the host controller also has a four terabyte hard drive inside of it that's field changeable. So what that means is let's say you have it in a remote area and it's just logging data and sending some important snippets back, so value-rich data back to shore. What you do is you go there, you open the cover, as one little piece of Velcro, you undo the Velcro, and you can exchange your hard drive in the field within maybe, say, five seconds, and you're done. So that's what it looks like in the inside when you open it up, just a watertight seal there for a hard drive. So I hope I answered. I gave a little bit more there, too, I know, but... No, more is always better. It helps us understand. But a word that we've been tossing around a lot is host. What's a host? What can be used as a host? I know you've mentioned um, a computer, which seems to be the <clears> obvious <throat> choice, but are there other hosts that can be used for an array? Yes. Yeah, so a host is something that is displaying the data or something that you're using the person. For example, if I go to the field, I need something to host what I'm looking at. So because all our equipment is Ethernet and simple, you can actually use anything that has a web browser. So let's say you have a cell phone, a tablet, a Windows machine, it could be a 1990s Android tablet. As long as it connects to the internet, you'll be able to get the data off of it and download the data and do everything you want. And so the host is pretty much anything that has web access that you can use to visualize the data. And what's interesting is, is there's a new twist about hosts as well, and that is that as people start putting our hydrophones on AUVs, and the AUVs are, they're truly autonomous, so they might use that data to, to change their course, change their behavior, whatever. So as soon as that happens, then those AUVs become a host as well for the hydrophones. So that's an interesting um, suggestion. Can you mount um, you know, multiple hydrophones on one AUV? 
but can you also mount um, multiple, like multiple AUVs with single hydrophones as a, a mobile array? You can, yeah. Um, it, it's certainly possible to mount uh, uh, one or more uh, hydrophones on, on an AUV. Uh, obviously, you need to make sure that you're not upsetting the balance, the center of gravity of, of these vehicles. But uh, our, our newer hydrophones are, are getting close to being uh, neutrally buoyant so that they have less of an impact on it. Uh, as for having multiple AUVs, what you're talking about is, is basically a hydrophone swarm. And there are some groups that are working with the AUV swarms um, using acoustic modems, unfortunately, which interfere with acoustics. Uh, if you're doing passive acoustics, but there's still some some really interesting possibilities about using autonomous swarms to do things with it. But still, I think it's still pretty early days to uh, you know to talk about that as as its own kind of existing application. Hmm. Well, something to look forward to. Yep. Near the end of the month, we'll do another another PowerPoint on it. Oh, fantastic! I'm looking forward to it. So, Pierre, you mentioned that someone can uh, record or log data, but you can also listen in real time. Why would somebody choose to log data versus listening? So Ocean Songs, we do focus on the real-time aspect. And we like things to actions and items to, to happen right away and to be notified right away. For example, if a whale's in danger or entangled, the real time is where, it's, where things are important. When you log data, the problem with logging data is that you log it for, say, one month, six months. You get that data six months later, and then you have to process all this data, and, it's, and it is overwhelming sometimes. So where we, we do, I do want to focus on the real time, but for those who, who do want to do the logging the data, it is still an option. It's still being used every day. And the reason you want to log hidden, I guess you would say, is that stuff does get stolen. And so it does happen on a regular basis. Things do tend to walk away in the middle of the water. Uh, another way, and the reason for that, so you can put an acoustic release on it. So it's, everything's completely underwater. Everything's hidden. Another way is that um, if you're in a, say, an, um, an environment that is very uh, critical, like an endangered species or the right whales or something that, that's going on that you don't want any type of cables or mooring lines or anything to get involved or even the sea bottom that don't want to get too much uh, cables going through it, that's when the logging comes into play. So you get the one little tripod, it stays there, and then you pick it up later. Um, and the biggest thing about that is or if you're on a big cliff or earthquakes or just where it's too dangerous to run a cable to it is where you want to log data. And um, we do have occasions where that is the only feasible way of, of doing it. Well, there's just one thing to add to that. And that is that uh, if you were doing stuff in real time, you can certainly eat your cake and have it. So you can record the data and stream data snippets at the same time. And why would you want to do that? Well, there, there's there's lots of reasons. The, the most obvious one is you might want to have like an audit record, some kind of check against what that processing has been doing. And in some cases, for example, compliance monitoring, uh, there might be a legal requirement to not only do stuff in real time, but also say, okay, uh, we have a record of this. So if you ever need to go back and check our stuff, here's, here's the recorded data as well. Or even a second backup. Yep. 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 So um, we've discussed power um, a little bit here. How are arrays powered? It's a, is it always battery? Is it a cable to shore? How do you actually supply the power that these hydrophones need to operate? Do I answer this one, Mark? This is his background. We <laughs> <laughs> can do either. So uh, our hydrophones draw about two watts. So if, if you've got four of them out there, now you need to power that thing with, with four watts. So um, if, if it's a one week duration, then there's, there's lots of batteries that can do that. If you want to put it out there for six months, drawing eight watts, then uh, you're gonna need a, a more sizable battery. So basically you need to do some power budgeting if you're going to run a battery power system. If you're powering from shore and you're just plugging in, then uh, you know four watts or eight watts, whatever is 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 pretty much in, inconsequential. So the, the if you can power it from, from shore, from a cable, that's the preferred way to do it. Uh, we do, do have people using buoys with uh, solar arrays on them and so, what that does is it, is it may not guarantee an indefinite deployment, but what it does is it takes a battery that has, say, 30 days of capacity and makes it into a 90-day one because it charges the battery up, and then when the seasons start to get a little lean uh, in terms of sunshine, then uh, the, the battery is is being used more uh, than, than otherwise. So there, there are other ways of, of powering it uh, once you have some kind of surface expression, either going to shore or going to a buoy or to a ship. Mm. 
So I have one last question for you. Um, can you give us a few real world examples of some arrays that are currently deployed and collecting data and what type of data and purpose they have? Oh, I gave two of them uh, in my presentation. So one, for example, is also known as a whale tracking network in BC, which is tracking the resident killer whales all in real time. So the reason this is very important is because we're not putting tracking devices on them. We're not interrupting them. We're not catching them. It's literally just listening. It's passive acoustics. And so you're not, you're not getting anything near the animals, which I find phenomenal. Uh, another one is doing um, the in golf, wow, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We have a couple drifting buoys there that are just strictly listening to the ambient noise and the, the right whales that are there. So again, we're not getting involved. We're not getting near them. So, and we're listening, getting all these really good listening and, or sorry, all these good high quality data from the buoys being drifting around. Another example would be in, um, in our backyard right here. In the, um, you got the open hydro with, with uh, some, um, an array right on it. It's listening still today. Although it's not being used anymore, it's still being, we're still picking up data from that or the drifting buoys uh, or the hydrophones on the flash on the fast platform. So there's a whole bunch of hydrophones just in our Bay of Fundy right here, and they're all synced together with their GPS. So we can actually collect all the data and stream all of them together. So those are just three examples just in Canada that are using rays. Do I give some, Rick? Uh, well, I guess another that comes to mind is we have some European researchers that are using hydrophone arrays to study uh, the what they call the sound channel. So that is the, the properties of sound in, in these various areas. And, and the reason why they want to know about how sound propagates through the, these water passages is because uh, there's a law there called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, and, and it's important for them to be able to model uh, sound intensity levels there as ships pass through it. So by knowing how sound behaves in these places, then they can predict just using shipping traffic what kind of sound levels can be there, and then they can hopefully manage the sound produced by either getting the ships to slow down or, or by getting them to pause and that kind of thing. So it's a really powerful tool for, for really understanding what sound is doing in, in these, these, these complicated uh, media where, where we need to manage the sound that's being produced there. I just want to add one more there. Another one is uh, we talk all about these uh, high frequency in marine mammals. And we do a lot of work in earth movements, earthquakes, tsunami monitoring. And there's a customer in Europe that has uh, surrounded um, a volcano, subsea volcano with their hydrophones that are actually monitoring in very precise locations to see the vibrations that are coming from that volcano. And so there's a large array and that is all being done subsea around a volcano, which is the only one I, I know of that we've done. I find it's uh, pretty phenomenal. That is a really interesting project. So uh, thank you so much for giving those examples. Um, those are all the questions that I have for now. So thank you again so much, Mark and Pierre. If there is a question that you didn't get to ask, please contact us by sending Ocean Sonics a message, or you can always drop us a line on our social media channels. If you want to revisit this presentation, it will be available on both YouTube and on our Facebook page, and I will share the link through the various social media channels belonging to Ocean Sonics. We'll be continuing with our Array October event next week when we are joined by researchers from the Ocean Observatories Initiative. Again, thank you for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you next Thursday at 2 p.m. Atlantic Daylight Time for another in-depth session all about acoustic arrays. See you then. Bye-bye.